basically, with the limited tools that we have, we should show to Russians, to Russian population, to the Russian ruling elite, to Russian business groups, that Putin is an incompetent leader. An incompetent leader who is leading the country into some kind of abyss. His imperial, aggressive political project uh, is a curse for Russia, not an opportunity for Russia. Hello, my name is Nicholas Furnival. You are watching or listening to an OSW interview. Today I'm talking to Dr. Maria Domainska, an expert from OSW's Russian department. We'll be discussing the upcoming presidential election in Russia. Hi, Maria. Hi, Nick. I'd like to start off with a quote I found from Dmitry Peskov to the New York Times. And he said, our presidential election is not really democracy. It is costly bureaucracy. I remember him saying that. Maybe it was just a slip of the tongue. Maybe uh, he was uh, completely serious about it. My overall impression is that if these people had a choice, they would probably cancel elections mm -hmm. as an unnecessary procedure that causes a lot of headaches but uh, doesn't bring any good. But in the authoritarian, autocratic systems, in dictatorships, elections still perform some functions. I mean, for the f uh, firstly, um, the leader needs to show to the ruling elite that he enjoys a significant amount of public support. It strengthens his position in the system. Mm -hmm. Secondly, he needs the elite to mobilize and to zealously show their engagement in providing the desired result of the election. So this is a sort of a test for the whole system. You can uh, check who is competent enough to uh, provide necessary results, sometimes against all odds. You can also punish those who prove not loyal enough. Uh, you, can also, um, you can also recruit new people from within the lower echelons of the elite. I mean, people who, um, who showed their effectiveness on the ground in providing desired results. When they rig the election, they need to suppress all possible public discontent. Mm -hmm. So the ideal picture is that the leader gets as many votes as he wants to, mm -hmm. and people don't rebel against the regime because of the rigging of the election. So you need peace on the ground, uh, suppressed opponents of the regime, and nice results uh, drawn on paper. Are we going to see this full scenario. I understand Putin's going to win and going to win easily, um, in the official results at least. But how is the social mood? Is it going to go ahead calmly without any rebellion on the, on the behalf of the general public? I don't predict any rebellion. Mm -hmm. uh, this election is designed as a triumph for Putin, a sort of a coronation of his very long rule, like over two decades already. And this is the least uh, competitive election in the uh, history of Russia after 1991. Mm -hmm. Under Putin's rule, none of the election was actually competitive. But this one, if we can like uh, compare with the previous ones, this one is the least competitive. He has only three sparring partners, uh, the representatives of the three parliamentary parties that are completely loyal, loyal to the Kremlin, and none of them has condemned the war. So this is just a fake. This is just a farce. Mm -hmm. And accordingly to unofficial information that leaked some time ago, the plan is to guarantee over 80% 80, 80 of votes for Putin. We will see. Uh, maybe uh, they will be overzealous and maybe he will get much more than 80%. Mm -hmm. The turnout, the planned turnout is around 70%. You talk about the uh, planned turnout and the planned results. So where are you hearing these rumors from? These are independent journalists who have some sources, unofficial sources in the Kremlin, around the Kremlin, um, uh, in the government. So um, they uh, basically say that there are instructions sent to uh, the authorities of various levels well before the election with some, uh, well, desired results 
to be um, to be achieved. Like a local quota. Yes, you can put it like that, local quota. So all the uh, all the governors, all the local governments in the regions, all the uh, members of electoral commissions of various levels, know very well what is expected from them. Now this election could have been a little more open because up until recent weeks there were two well one potential candidate and one opposition figure who was in prison could you go over the stories of Navalny and Nadezhdin please uh, Navalny couldn't play any role in the election mm-hmm. because uh, he had been in prison for three years mm-hmm. He died in February. We don't know what exactly happened. There is an investigation uh, conducted by independent journalists about it. But we know that it was political killing anyway. I mean, Mm. either he was uh, murdered in mid-February in the prison or uh, his death was, was just a logical result of the three years of torture and harassment. Mm-hmm. He was kept in very bad conditions. So anyway, he was murdered, and the authorities for three years played with this idea of his possible death. And it was done on purpose to intimidate all other uh, opponents of this regime. It was done on purpose. The timing was on purpose. Uh, well, the timing, we are not sure about what was with the timing, because if his death was, let's say, for, of, for natural reasons, so he was just tortured, low, uh, slowly tortured to death, it's one case. If he was murdered precisely in mid-February, we also don't know the exact date of his death. Um, It would mean that that the Kremlin decided to kill him in this precise moment. It was an overt manifestation of Putin's confidence. Mm -hmm. If he ordered to kill Navalny uh, at that precise moment, it would mean that he wanted to show uh, the Russians and the West that he is so self-confident before the election that he can cross this red line of killing the main political opponent and he's not afraid of any serious consequences. Uh, So he expects rather a meek reaction from the West um, to this killing and he expects to suppress all um, all opposition and all discontent within the country. The opposition has effectively been suppressed already, uh, independently of uh, this Navalny's uh, case. Uh, so any significant activity of the opposition and a civil society takes place in exile. Although there are quite many people still in Russia who try to do something, who try to um, to continue their in- engagement in the grassroots projects, uh, civic projects, democratic projects, but this is uh, this is really more and more um, difficult. And killing Navalny was, in some sense, about killing the hope, because many people hoped that one day Navalny could be released, maybe after. Putin's departure Mm -hmm. someday. Now this hope, uh, this hope uh, has passed. Uh, Could I could I make a Russian pun on hope? So um, Boris Nadezhdin, whose name translates as something related to hope, was um, bold enough to compete against Putin, but he's not on the ballot paper. Why is he missing from the ballot paper? Well, he decided to uh, to run in this election. And I think that the Kremlin made a sort of a mistake when they allowed him to collect the signatures of mm-hmm. support. He represented the uh, non-parliamentary Democratic Liberal Party Civic Initiative. The Kremlin could have blocked his nomination at the, at the stage of party nomination. Probably they wanted to show that anti-war and anti-Putin um, uh, attitude, mm-hmm. which is what Nadezhdin uh, presented, uh, openly in the public uh, is some sort of a marginal view that doesn't enjoy any wider public support. But then when he started to collect the signatures, it um, it soon uh, turned out that people really quickly mobilized to support him. And we saw the photos of very long queues in some cities of people 
um, standing to um, to support Nadezhdin uh, in written, offering all their mm-hmm. contact details, all their personal data, which is risky by definition in this system. But they decided to express this way their anti-war stance in the only formally legal way that has been left in Russia. Then he collected twice as much votes, uh, uh, twice as much signatures as was required. Mm -hmm. So it was 200,000 people. For me, it was clear from some point that they just can't register him, that they can't um, allow him to speak against the war and against Putin in public during the whole presidential campaign. Uh, so obviously they used any pretext possible to uh, to um, disqualify him from running. We're not debating here whether the elections are fixed, but what is the mechanism? How do they fix it? Because somehow people are still going to the polls and the votes are still being counted. So where does it happen? The elections in Russia are rigged in two ways. So the first source of the election rigging is the very nature of this political system, where there is no room for public, for political competition. Mm -hmm. There is no room for the freedom of speech. There is no room for um, for uh, public gatherings, uh, demonstrations that are not authorized by the Kremlin and the, by the law enforcement uh, agencies. Um, so all the political competition has been long ago eliminated from the public life, uh, although it was a very long process of uh, tightening the screws uh, over the time. The second thing is the very process of voting. So we have no independent monitoring. Uh, the results are rigged uh, because the protocols are rewritten after the voting to fit the instructions from the Kremlin Mm -hmm. and so on. But what is the most interesting is the pre-electoral period because we see unprecedented censorship, we see unprecedented digital surveillance, we see unprecedented indoctrination and propaganda campaigns uh, against all people who are not loyal enough to the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. Um, So recently we've seen a big crackdown on um, artists, on writers, on people who don't uh, comply with the so-called traditional values. This is one of the many aspects of Putinism as an ideology. Uh, this appeal to traditional values, which boils down to things like xenophobia, anti-Westernism, misogyny, uh, homophobia, things like that that we know uh, quite well from many other countries. But Mm -hmm. in Russia, uh, the state is deliberately organizing all the state machine around promoting this kind of values. We see indoctrination in the schools and universities. Uh, it's called patriotic education, but it's based on militarism and to Westernism, hate, hate speech, hatred towards Ukraine and the West, the cult of the war, the personality cult of Putin, and the cult of battlefield death. This, uh, these are values that are uh, are being instilled in the Russian population, especially the young generations. Everyone who tries to speak in the public against this aggressive war, against war crimes, against mass violations of human rights within Russia, uh, is considered a uh, enemy of the state, a foreign agent, a spy. We've seen a surge in uh, criminal cases um, against uh, so-called spies against traitors of the nation. So this repressive machine is uh, working more and more harshly and more and more actively uh, to uh, to actually uh, not only suppress all the discontent, but also to make people openly, actively demonstrate their support for the regime. It's more and more often like this. So that's why I call this system not authoritarian anymore. It's neo-totalitarian. With all differences that we see between this system and the classic totalitarianism of the Soviet era, Mm -hmm. 
as regards its goals and, and the very nature, like the spirit, is totalitarian. Uh, and we should also remember about it. It's not like a normal authoritarian leadership that you can negotiate with about the future of the security system, for example. This um, this regime is aggressive by nature, um, and it has proved it many times already. I'm pretty sure that we will not see any lasting peace in Europe without political change in Russia, which is in the strategic interest of the West. And given that this election is a fake, this election is a farce, another farce in Russia's history, I'm sure that the West shouldn't recognize Putin as the legitimate president of Russia after um, after the pseudo-election. The thing that we haven't mentioned so far is that, um, in fact, for the first time in his political career, Putin is running illegally because he's running on the basis of the amended constitution. Um, the constitutional reform in Russia took place in 2020, and this reform violated the constitution in force at the time, uh, both in spirit and in letter. Then a constitutional referendum followed, which was a complete farce and didn't reflect in any way the, the genuine mood of the public. Um, so Putin wanted to guarantee himself that he will stay in power until the end of his life. So even on the grounds of the domestic Russian law, uh, this election is highly questionable and uh, Putin's status as a leader is highly questionable. Plus, of course, he is a war criminal. He organizes this election on the occupied territories of Ukraine, where the population is subject to brutal Russification. Mm -hmm. All in all, uh, there are, are enough reasons for, uh, for the West not to recognize him. Actually, I can't, uh, I can't find any reason to recognize him. Many people are afraid of implementing this nuclear option of not recognizing Putin as a leader. But actually, uh, if we look at it in a sober way, first, Putin is not credible as a possible future partner for negotiations anyway. Mm -hmm. He will violate any agreement he will sign or negotiate with the West about Ukraine. Any agreement that he will negotiate with Ukraine about the bilateral relations. Secondly, um, paradoxical as it may seem, given that all the Kremlin propaganda is harshly anti-Western, they consider the West to be Russia's eternal enemy, and they, at the same time, they despise Western democracies. Paradoxically enough. Uh, they crave Western respect for them. And uh, all the propaganda hype about, about uh, Putin's in Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin was just another proof of this paradox that they need legitimacy from the West, from the principal enemy, as they say. So this uh, non-recognition would be a serious uh, image blow for Putin Similar to the blow that was delivered by the arrest warrant against Putin issued mm. by the International Criminal Court, the propaganda machine didn't didn't know what to do about it. They ignored the subject because they couldn't sell it to the public in a desired way. So I'm pretty sure that that would be a very good uh, method of undermining Putin's position in the system without uh, using any direct tools that we just can't use, uh, of course. Also, it would be a very uh, important uh, signal to, to the whole ruling elite in Russia that is not very happy with the war and this conflict against this conflict with the West and Russia's self-isolation. They demonstrate their loyalty. Uh, but uh, they would be very happy one day, I'm pretty sure about it, to uh, negotiate some kind of normalization with the West. But they should understand that if they want to talk with the West 
or with Ukraine, um, they should first get rid of Putin because he is just not the one that we can talk to. He is not credible. But first of all, to undermine his position in the system and to maybe somehow contribute to the political change in Russia, which is, of course, in Russians' hands, not in our hands, but we can do much more than, than we've been doing since the f- full-scale invasion started. We should accelerate our military support for Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And we, of course, should tweak the sanctions regime so that it's... Um, difficult to bypass the sanctions. Basically, with the limited tools that we have, we should show to Russians, to Russian population, to the Russian ruling elite, to Russian business groups, that Putin is an incompetent leader, an incompetent leader who is leading the country into some kind of abyss. And uh, that uh, this, his imperial aggressive uh, political project Uh, is a curse for Russia, not an opportunity for Russia. And that could uh, create a, uh, an opportunity, a chance for some kind of political change in the country. Of course, there is no ironclad guarantee for that. But um, but this uh, could be another aspect of helping Ukraine and helping uh, the whole Europe, in fact, to achieve a lasting peace in the future. And this is also, uh, that, that will also be beneficial for the uh, whole uh, global security system. But before we get there, uh, we have to have the, as Mr. Pieskov said, costly bureaucracy of the election. And we'll be keeping an eye on the results in the next few days. Yeah, and we will see how much the effective Russian bureaucracy will be able to uh, to rig the election, to rig the voting results, to to show that Putin is uh, a leader without any alternative, a savior of the nation, because he's presented uh, in this way by the propaganda. Uh, how many uh, people will actually come to the ballot? Uh, whether there will be any... Um, any shows of uh, public discontent. Uh, The opposition uh, is encouraging people to come, not necessarily to vote, but to come to the the voting stations uh, at noon uh, on Sunday, March 17th, to show their anti-war protest. So it it is supposed to be a silent protest without any um, any signs, without any slogans, because everything is illegal. But this is um, the only thing they, they can actually do to come in thousands, maybe uh, to the ballot stations across Russia. Um, and the people coming there at this precise time on this precise day, will know that the rest also have come to manifest his anti-Putin stance. This is not about changing the vote uh, results. This is about uh, showing that there is still a part of Russia that is strongly against uh, the war crimes and the crimes of the regime, but these people don't have any other uh, room, any other space for Um, for legally expressing uh, their stance. Okay. So, Maria, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this conversation, why not watch a previous video with Maria where she discusses the limitations in analyzing a country closed off to foreign analysts. The link's available on screen now.